Uh, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, online today. Uh, we've got a special guest, uh, Martina Stenzel from the University of New South Wales. Uh, it says here Martina is an ARC Future Fellow, but uh, I guess recently promoted uh, in terms of acquiring a, an ARC Laureate uh, Fellowship. So congratulations, Martina. And um, uh, Martina is recognised that being at the forefront uh, of Australian polymer science uh, and not only at the forefront of fundamental breakthroughs and developments, but the application of those uh, breakthroughs and developments through to uh, very important strategic areas, particularly in the area of utilising nanoparticles and, and looking at novel systems for drug delivery. And Martina's got a whole range of prizes that I won't read out, and of course, is very accomplished in terms of the number of publications. Uh, I've had the pleasure to share uh, the stage with Martina on a number of occasions, and along with all of those uh, fundamental and applied breakthroughs, uh, she brings uh, an enthusiasm for science that's pretty unmatched uh, around the country. And I think it's a privilege to uh, introduce Martina today uh, to, to give us a, a bit of a chat on what she's been doing recently. And uh, congratulations again, and, and thank you for your continuing contributions to Australian science. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me. So it's uh, it's always great to talk to a, a slightly different community about what I'm doing and uh, uh, give you a little bit of a, a, an appreciation about my field. So maybe um, just very quickly, can you actually see my pointer moving, uh, wriggling around? Oh, I can. Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So. Um, well, I'm basically from the uh, field of um, uh, polymer science, and uh, my interest is really making polymer nanoparticles for drug delivery. And uh, when we look at uh, polymer nanoparticles, there's always this idea of the Trojan horse, and I want to sort of dispel that myth a little bit, but I'm going to come back to the Trojan horse a little bit later. So I'm basically in the forefront um, uh, of nanomedicine and uh, nanomedicine is considered sort of the marriage of medicine and nanotechnology. And there are a whole range of different fields here. And uh, of course, the area I'm interested in is the nanotherapeutics. And it's a really growing field. And it's sort of estimated that this um, field um, is gonna be worth 350 billion by the year 2025. So, um, I want to give you a little bit of an introduction or give you just more feel about this field instead of going too much um, in the details of what I'm doing. Um, because I want you to sort of uh, um, go away with an appreciation how difficult uh, that field actually is. So the motivation is uh, when we administer drugs um, orally or with a needle, the drug really goes everywhere in the body. Um, it goes into your, um, into your hair, it goes into your fingers, wherever, but you really want to tailor it uh, towards uh, a certain side of action where your pain is, where your cancer is, and so on. But the reality is only a very small amount of drugs actually go where it's needed. And so the, the, the broad uh, systemic distribution of drugs in the body lead really to a lower efficacy of the drugs a lot of side effects because we need to um, uh, consider a lot of drugs are actually poison. And uh, we also have the problem very often we don't even know where the drugs go. So we just see the side effect, but we don't really know where the drugs really ended up. So this idea of having um, um, uh, something like a vehicle that can deliver the drug where you really need it, that was a coin already more than 100 years ago by this happy looking gentleman here, Paul Ehrlich. And so he coined that uh, term magic bullet, bullet. And so his idea was that we use something that carries um, the active drug around, the pharmaceutical carrier. And we have more than one drug molecule in there. So we make it really um, uh, toxic. But we also have something on the surface um, that helps us to uh, deliver the drug, something that sort of finds its way to the side of drug uh, action. And so back then, that was actually um, um, very revolutionary uh, thinking uh, because there was a time where we barely had a proper microscope. But this idea of the magic bullet has been around for a very long time and uh, people are still working on this model here. So 
the idea of the magic bullet is really that, um, first of all, that that nanoparticle now can, for example, enhance the solubility of the drug. And um, that's actually a very big uh, problem because a lot of drugs have been, uh, for example, developed um, on the computer screen um, in, the, in the organic synthesis lab. And this in theory would work really well, but they're very, very hydrophobic. So what happens when you put them into the bloodstream apart from that they might aggregate, they're very cleared, uh, quickly cleared from the body. So by putting it into water soluble nanoparticle, we enhance the solubility of the drug. By enhancing the solubility, we also enhance the circulation time of the drug. What we really want is that the blood stays in the body, uh, the drug stays in the blood body for a really long period of time. But these nanoparticles are also um, supposed to uh, address other issues, for example, drug resistance, which is a huge is issue. For example, the most commonly used anti-cancer drugs, uh, platinum drugs, but a lot of cancer cells develop now uh, drug resistance to it. Um, but we also would like to accumulate it in the disease side. And so this is where these targeting ligands help. So the idea is really that every um, a site in your body has receptors overexpressed on the surface. And all we, we need now is a ligand. And this sort of lock, key lock principle, hopefully these nanoparticles can find the matching um, counterpart. So there are many nanoparticles around. And um, I'm working here on, on polymeric particles, the polymeric micelles. I'm not saying that they're better than anything else. Um, I, I like them because they have a lot of flexibility. We can modify a lot of things. We can modify um, size, uh, properties, uh, functionality. But um, there are a lot of benefits into all these in these other nanoparticles. For example, the inorganic nanoparticles, they're very, very good for imaging. Viruses, um, they're really quite interesting because um, viruses have been evolved over millions of years to, um, um, to circulate in the bloodstream for a long time. They don't, uh, they stay undetected by the body's um, um, immune system. So they're really very clever little things. But of course you can imagine if you use a virus, um, you need to be very careful not to cause any immune response. So this slide here really summarizes what the issue is and why this, um, field, although it sounds like a great idea, it's really, really quite difficult. So um, we start off here with our little nanoparticle. So if we in, um, inject the nanoparticle now in the bloodstream, then chances are these nanoparticles are very um, quickly cleared by the, by the liver or by the, um, um, by the, um, the spleen, by the kidney, and so on. Then um, it starts circulating, but um, hopefully it sort of passes the tumor tissue. So it goes to the bloodstream until it reaches the tumor. And the next challenge is that it needs to go from the bloodstream into the tumor uh, tissue by a process called extravasation. So we have um, our bloodstream here, and these nanoparticles need to go through, um, uh, through these cells here. And this is actually a quite slow process. And you might have the nanoparticles sitting on the surface of the tumor, but it doesn't mean they actually can um, penetrate into the tumor sufficiently. The tumor can be actually quite a dense tissue. It might have a lot of cells, uh, for example, like stroma cells that are real barriers. And um, it might actually be really hard for these nanoparticles to go in there. And even if they go in there, it does not mean that they necessarily go inside the cancer cells. So the, the last step is basically going, crossing this membrane here, um, the cell membrane, going into the cancer cell and in the cancer cell, the drug ne needs to be released. So it's a really, really long uh, uh, journey here for the nanoparticle. And at the very end, um, um, we're basically hoping that this uh, drug carrier here recognizes the cancer cell using these uh, receptors here, specific receptors, but it doesn't teach, uh, uh, touch healthy cells. So um, a very long journey. And so uh, when we look for um, uh, the perfect nanoparticle, we want a lot of things. So first of all, 
it needs to circulate in the bloodstream without being detected by the immune system. Um, it should not accumulate in the liver spleen, which is a huge issue. Um, uh, nanoparticles love going into the liver. It should find a tumor issue, tissue and only enter cancerous cells, but not healthy cells. It should only release the drugs inside the cancer cell. So we don't want to have a nanoparticle where the drug leaches out while it's still in the bloodstream. And the last thing is sort of something people just started appreciating very recently is that these nanoparticles should not absorb uh, proteins from the bloodstream. And, um, um, and it's now identified as one of the reasons why some nanoparticles um, fail. So this is sort of our cartoon, how we want it to be. We want to have our nanoparticle here. There's some beautiful targeting ligands. We have here our cell membrane uh, with the receptors um, of, uh, for example, cancer cells. And ideally, they should recognize each other. In reality, if we're not careful and we don't design our nanoparticle very well, then these nanoparticles get quickly coated in the bloodstream by proteins. So just think about the blood. Blood has 7% proteins. The most common one are albumins, but there are tens of different proteins here. So depending now on what absorbs on the surface, you change the properties of these nanoparticles quite significantly. And it really might uh, decide the fate of your nanoparticles. So it basically shows it's a very, very complex problem. It really requires the collaboration of many uh, people. You have the chemists, you have the physicists to really understand uh, nanoparticles and, um, and their properties. But of course, you have the biology and the, the biology associated with medicine. So when people discuss nanoparticles, they, they usually divide them into four different um, properties. So there's first of all the type of nanoparticle, size and shape, surface bioactivity and surface functionality. So these things determine what happens to nanoparticles. So what I found though is that this is a very simplified view and it actually is much, much more complicated. So I wanna show you how complicated that is using um, the type of particles I typically work with um, and these are my cells. So my cells are made from uh, block copolymers. So um, block copolymers are basically polymers that have two different parts. They have a hydrophilic part, so a polymer that is water soluble and a polymer that is not water soluble. And we put them into water, they start self-assembling by themselves. So depending now on that polymer, you can get different structures. You can get round micelles, you can rods, vesicles. And what's nice about them is that they're very similar to natural carriers such as viruses in size. So if we're thinking of micelles, very often they have sizes of around 50 nanometers. That's very similar to um, your typical uh, spherical viruses. So your coronavirus would, would have a similar size. So the micelles are also um, in a good size to prevent um, uptake by, um, or the recognition uh, by the immune system. So it uh, tend to um, circulate a little bit longer, but also we have a lot of um, surface um, uh, functionality. So when you sort of look at the end groups here, at every end group, you could, for example, add um, a ligand. So um, uh, Australia is really on the forefront of polymer design. So I think that's something um, among other things we can be really pr proud of, but um, Australia really leaves a mark um, um, on the world atlas of polymer chemistry. And that's thanks to people like, for example, here, Ezio Rosado he's, and David Solomon. So they both retired, but they really contributed to um, developing um, um, new sy synthetic tools. And for example, they invented a um, polymerization called raft polymerization. And then you can, with this raft polymerization, you can get now access to a lot of different block copolymers. So you uh, can get, um, you can change the, the, um, uh, the length of each block, you can uh, change the structure, um, and it can all be done very, very easily. And so what people do nowadays, they actually make poly polymers on a robot on, for example, 96% valve plate. So in one go, you can make 96 um, different polymers by, uh, by using techniques, just as rough polymerization. So a massive throughput 
So why is this important? It's because by changing the block sizes, you change the, the type of nanoparticle you're getting. So for example, if you have a very short hydrophobic block, you get small micelles. If you make the hydrophobic block a little bit bigger, you get bigger micelles until you get to a point where your hydrophobic block is now so long that you get different aggregates. Then you get to hear elongated structures or you get um, something that very much like vesicles and because they're based on polymers, we call them polymer zones. So because we have now this tool set where we can make so many polymers in a very short period of time, we can always tailor um, our polymers to our drug delivery problem. So this is our polymer here. And now we can um, modify these polymers depending on what we want. For example, the red block here, that's the part that would be in contact with the drug you would like to deliver. The shell part here, uh, the blue one would form the micelle shell and it needs to be hydrophilic. And this is basically what the body sees. So if your blue part is not functioning well, the whole nanoparticle is not working well. And you can, for example, have a little targeting ligand here. So the length of both a block influences the, um, um, influences the micelle size. So we can now deliver hydrophobic drugs. We can also uh, deliver charged drugs, which is very important because a lot of drugs under development are based on nucleic acid like um, sdRNA, uh, plasmid DNA. But um, we can also conjugate um, the drug um, onto the polymer. So there are not really no limitations on what we can do. And of course, depending on what the delivery mode is, we will change um, uh, the, uh, the drug release again. So, a lot of uh, systems in the clinic or in, um, on the market are based on polyethylene glycol. It's sort of a little bit considered a gold standard in drug delivery. And it's great because it increases the circulation time and usually PEC shows very, very low protein fi uh, filing. But uh, recently people have found that um, there can be actually um, some side effects. We, uh, for example, it can cause immunogenicity. So what I'm exploring are alternative hydrophilic uh, shells. And one of them I want to talk to you about are glycopolymers. So glycopolymers are polymers that are based on sugars. And you can really use any type of sugars. And what I'm showing you here are very simple sugars. But of course, you can have very complex sugars as well. And so what we're generating here is a polymer with uh, a backbone on the side here. We have um, the uh, sugar attached. And um, so the story I want to tell you today is um, predominantly based on fruct uh, fructose polymers. And so this, um, my former PhD student, Cha Cheng, he started that work. And uh, the motivation for that is, is because um, uh, sugars are not just sort of these nice little sweet things, but they're incredibly bioactive. So a lot of cells in your body have um, sugar receptors on the uh, surface. And um, there's a receptor specifically for fructose, it's called a GLUT5 receptor. And what's really interesting about the GLUT5 receptor, that is overexpressed um, in, uh, on, in breast cancer, for example, but not in healthy uh, memory tissues. So what Chachin did, um, thanks to raft polymerization, he made a few uh, block copolymers um, with sugars attached here and made micelles of different sizes. And so what he wanted to understand first how are these micelles taken up by cells? And what you find is um, that when you add a little fluorescent marker and you observe how these micelles go into the cells, that you have a very, very good uptake by breast cancer cells. So on the bottom here and here on the side here, um, the different breast cancer cells, and you get a very high uptake. So what you're seeing here is something called flow cytometry that basically measures how many nanoparticles are in there. But at the top here, um, you see healthy cells, um, like for example, um, uh, macrophages here, and these are uh, Chinese hamster ovary cells. They have very little cellular uptake. So we thought, this is great. All we need to do is attach a few sugars on the surface, and it's going to work beautifully. But um, uh, with all these things, very soon you stumble over uh, problems. And that's usually where it gets very interesting. Problems are always a good thing because um, big discoveries are never really made because 
um, uh, you had a hypothesis and you prove a hypothesis, they're really made because you find something that just didn't work. And the first thing that didn't work was um, when Mia made block copolymers based on the same sugar, but she made now different micelles um, where um, the sugar was presented in very different ways. So we had here more sort of like a brush-like um, arrangement. And here we had sort of very loose particles. And, um, and so what she found was um, that if you have this brush-like arrangements, you get very, very little um, uh, cellular uptake. And the longer the polymer is on the surface uh, here, the better is the uptake. And that was really interesting because we, we always assume, well, just by having a targeting ligand there, like the uh, sugar, it should work really well, but it didn't. So and this is the point where just our simple chemistry knowledge um, 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 doesn't really work anymore. But having said that, um, we know now that um, cellular uptake is really just one aspect here. But what happens um, uh, before that? And um, the cellular uptake, you can basically image here with, um, with an experiment in the Petri dish. That's basically what I just showed you, where you have your mice cells, you incubate them with uh, cells, and you monitor after a while, do my own uh, mice cells go inside. On the other side, to understand how uh, nanoparticles circulate, we need to go into animal studies. So, um, but we wanted to understand a little bit more about these nanoparticles. And we wanted to understand, for example, how these nanoparticles penetrate in the tissue. So we really wanted, were very interested in this window here. And to understand that, um, we can close the gap using sort of artificial uh, tumor models. So you can basically grow cancer cells in a 3D um, uh, system, and you can really uh, simulate um, the tumor in terms of um, penetration, how nutrition fl uh, flow into a tissue. So it's actually really a qu um, quite good way of learning more about our nanoparticles. And, um, and down there, you see pictures what they look like. So that's a tumor on day um, zero. And then you grow them over 14 days and you see how it gets bigger and bigger. So now you take these tumors and you incubate nanoparticles and you look at the movement of um, uh, particles and you find again, when we have now very loose particles, very long particles on the surface, they seem to penetrate much better in the surface. So um, what we needed to do is we needed to, to invest, analyze our nanoparticles a little bit more. And we did that with the help of, um, of ENSTO and some scattering techniques. And what we found here is, um, that we got some information about the core and the shell size. But what was really more important is that we got some information about the hydration of the shell here. So we have here a water soluble shell. And the longer these polymers are, the more water is inside. And water is really a good thing because water does not, um, the more hydrophilic it is, the less non specific protein absorption you get. So this really helped us now to connect the nanoparticle characterization with, uh, with the biological experiment, and we could link the two. So if we have very long polymers here, very free flowing, a lot of water, we have only a little uh, non-specific protein absorption. And so these sugar molecules here can attach very nicely to the membrane here. So looking at that, we actually said, well, um, it sort of means that we need to have very long polymers, but we also should have a low, a very, only a few polymers. So we don't want to have this really dense brush. We want to have these polymers nicely flowing around uh, so they can really interact with the receptors on the surface. So, so that was sort of our hypothesis. Um, we need to have a better access um, uh, to fructose. If we make a nanoparticle that looks like that, it should work beautifully. So we can do that by changing um, the conditions in which we make these nanoparticles. And um, so what the student uh, Cheng did here, he sort of played around a little bit how we made these nanoparticles. And he got four types of nanoparticles. And they all looked like they had the same size. But what we knew now from scattering techniques, um, 
is that they had different grafting densities. So when we go back here, although they, they looked the same under the microscope, the reality was they had very different grafting densities. So M4 here well, had very, very dense um, polymers and one had very loose polymers. So according to our hypothesis, M1 should have the really the best cellular uptake. And so we did that, we incubated that with a few uh, different cell lines and we did find it had indeed the best cellular uptake here. And the more, uh, the higher the grafting density was, the less it goes down and sort of our um, model where we said, well, um, our polymers here on the surface need room to move around and to interact with the receptor. That should have really worked well. So, however, with things like that, um, sometimes it's worthwhile to drill a little bit deeper. And we drilled a little bit deeper and said, well, let's actually look what happens when you put these nanoparticles into blood serum and measure how many proteins are absorbed non-specifically. And what we found was that actually this very thin dense layer here absorbs the highest amount of proteins. So um, what we really had here was not a sugar-based uh, uh, nanoparticle. We had a lot of proteins around here that might have inhibited the interaction with the cell, the, the specific interaction with the cell. However, what was even more interesting was that we started off with round particles and now we put them into a protein solution and suddenly they changed their shape. And really what we measured with our, um, uh, in our biological experiment, they were not really round particles, they were deformed particles. And we know deformed particles, they have a very different way of interacting with cells. And it really sort of shows you how important it is to go down and really try to analyze um, what you have in, in a lot of detail. So, um, so that this non-specific protein binding of the various blood proteins is sort of a little bit seen at the moment at the enemy of drug delivery. But I think if we understand the nanoparticles, we can basically um, uh, control um, the protein we have on the surface. And um, you can actually get a lot of inspiration from nature. And I think these days we see a lot of um, uh, pictures like this here. Um, but I've always found viruses actually quite interesting because they do have uh, very often this corona structure. And the question is, why did they evolve like that? Um, and uh, the beautiful thing is about polymer science, we can actually make particles that look a little bit like that. And there's an example here where we made uh, polymer origami, but in that case with a dry block called polymer. And we wanted to uh, understand uh, what happens now with when we have poly, um, sort of uh, nanoparticles that are, that are not round and smooth, but are really more um, um, structured like these ones here? Does this have any effect on protein absorption? And uh, therefore, we have prepared two systems. So we made here round particles and we made here sort of very patterned uh, particles. And on the surface, we had various um, sugars here. So, so the, the idea was now, if we have uh, polymers like that, they have these sugars on the surface. If they're covered now with uh, non-specific proteins, they will not display very specific bindings. So um, in that case here, we actually used mannose here. We wanted to see is there a specific binding to the mannose receptors on the surface um, of the cell. And this is the difference between patchy and smooth surfaces. And um, um, I'm not going to go into details of the experiment. I just want to show you the results. And there was actually a huge difference because when we had smooth particles here, we found there was a, um, a immediately formation of a protein corona. So these sugar nanoparticles they were immediately coated with a very, very thick protein layer. And uh, this protein layer did, did not then determine the cell uptake and there was no specific uptake anymore. While the patchy particles, they had a very, very low protein binding and, um, and therefore they had a much better um, uh, specific um, uh, cellular uptake. So we learned a lot of things in the journey really. And um, so um, 
apart from really appreciating the importance of characterizing, we knew that longer polymers have better hydration, they have more mobility, um, but we need to sort of consider still nevertheless, what happens to protein binding? How will polymer length, grafting density, and so on affect um, non-specific uh, protein binding? Then, uh, when we sort of analyze what kind of proteins are on the surface, um, we can really not predict it. So it's quite something very random. We found, for example, some nanoparticles where we have more albumin on the surface and, and other uh, uh, nanoparticles, we have more immunoglobulins on the surface. And again, it was very much dependent on all these different parameters. But by changing that composition of the proteins on the surface, you could change very much what happens to these nanoparticles. So we want to use these nanoparticles as well to deliver drugs. So far, we didn't really, we looked just at empty particles. And, um, and this is where sort of these assumptions come in in literature. For the first uh, assumption is uh, always that drug loading does not affect shape and behavior. And so we have a drug and the drug sort of sits nicely in the center of these nanoparticles. And shape and size is not affected. And so this is sort of this idea a little bit of the Trojan horse. We have something on the inside, but our Trojan horse on the outside doesn't really change um, uh, its shape. The other thing is that we need to put a lot of drugs in there. The more drugs, the better. And um, again, as you can see here, overloading things is not always a good idea. It's, it makes sense that people say the more drug is better because your nanoparticle is really just a carrier. It's a plastic bag, basically. It's our nanoplastic bag. And at the end, we want to get rid of it. It's rubbish. It's rubbish the body needs to get rid of. So ideally, if we can design a nanoparticle with 95% drug and 5% uh, polymer, that would be great. But we need to be very careful um, understanding what happens really in this process. So, um, we usually ex uh, expect that when we put the drugs inside the nanoparticle, it's very quickly taken up by the cell and the cell doesn't even know that there are drugs inside. So the idea is the cell just looks at this nanoparticle and thinks there's a nice sugar coated ball coming that looks very delicious, takes it up. And of course, inside the, um, the cell, the drug is released. So the question is, will the cell know uh, that the drugs inside, or can it actually sense the danger? So then um, um, I'm just going to show you an example where we used, where we used curcumin. And so we uh, loaded these uh, micelles with curcumin. We loaded them with different amount of drugs. And we wanted to understand if we have increasing amount of drugs, do these uh, nanoparticles behave differently? And so what we actually found first was really interesting because we found that with increasing amount of drugs, the uptake re reduces. So here, uh, if we don't have any drugs, we set the uptake to 100%. And the more drugs we put in, the less uptake we have. And that's across several cell lines. So obviously something is happening. If you put nanoparticles in there, your cells don't like the nanoparticles anymore. Um, and of course, the more drug we have, um, the less to toxic the whole thing became because the less nanoparticles are taken up, the less drug we get inside. So this is not really what we plan to do. We want to have a nanoparticle where, that has a really good uptake and we deliver a lot of drugs inside. So why does higher drug loading translate into lower activity? And so we really need to look a little bit more careful. And this is now a very extreme example because we saw immediately what's happening. So what we actually started off with, um, we wanted to load drugs into these rod-like micelles here. And now when we put in drugs, it actually changed shapes. But um, the more drugs we had, the smaller your nano, uh, nanoparticles became. So we could sort of understand that when you go from one shape to another one, that it changes the cellular uptake. What we couldn't understand is when we go smaller in size, 
why the uptake uh, gets lower, although it should actually um, have gotten better. So again, we need to um, uh, really uh, investigate now uh, what happens with these nanoparticles. And we can sort of see already um, from the way the relationship between self-assembly and drug is progressing, that the drug is probably sitting in the shell, but you can confirm this using again, um, uh, X-ray scattering. And the result from the X-ray scattering is that the drug actually, when it was um, sitting there, leaked slowly into the shell. So the drug wasn't in the core at all. Um, although it was a hydrophobic drug, and hydrophobic drugs should be in the hydrophobic core. So it leached into the shell. And by leaching into the shell, what happened is it dehydrated the shell. So suddenly our shell became actually quite hydrophobic. And the reality is what our cell is seeing, it sees sort of a quite dehydrated um, nanoparticle with sort of the drug sti st uh, sticking out like, like a little warning sign. And so really, um, um, that's what we were hoping, sort of a good uptake with increasing amount of drugs. And this is actually what we saw. Having said that, sort of we, we tested many, many systems, and we do have systems where we increase the amount of drugs and the system does become more effective. But we also see a lot of systems where we increase the amount of drug and the system becomes less effective. So I think, again, we need to really um, um, understand how do drugs and polymers interact with each other and how does this affect the nanoparticle size. So what we learned is that the, the field of drug delivery is very, very complicated. So we do, did start off with um, um, assuming these are the four things that really um, um, determine drug delivery. In reality, we know there are a lot of things really. It's, um, it's not just the surface um, uh, functionality in the size and shape, but it's also the arrangement of the polymer on the surface, the length of the polymer, the drug that is in there, um, and then many more, the stability of these particles. So there are a lot of things we haven't even listed here yet. So nevertheless, it all sounds like um, gloom and doom, uh, doom and gloom or whatever it's called. Uh, but reality is we have products coming on the market and we still have a lot of products in clinical trials. And, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of money going into this field. And I think the key really to get this field um, um, uh, moving along is that we have large interdisciplinary teams where we have, uh, as I said before, people working on, um, uh, on the physics, on the chemistry and the biology, and they really sort of uh, talk to each other to really help improving and optimizing drug um, delivery system. So nanoparticles are an excellent way to overcome a lot of um, uh, drug delivery problems. But we really need to understand the structure of these nanoparticles to really um, uh, improve um, the performance. So at the end, I'm, I need to uh, thank my wonderful group of PhD students here. And uh, so as you see, it's a very uh, international group. Um, and of course, I need to thank the Australian Research Council for funding. Yeah, and I would like to thank um, uh, for having me today. It's uh, always an experience talking to a computer. But um, I hope I could take you through a little journey here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I talk much too long, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martina. Um, is, if anybody's got any questions, they can just stick them in the, the chat box. Uh, uh, Martina, I just got a, a, a general question. Are there instances where I mean, so most of the properties you talked about that looked like the functionalization was pretty homogeneous, the particle size was pretty homogeneous. I mean, is there any ever any argument where you don't want a homogeneous system to get the most effective drug delivery? That's a very interesting thought, actually, because um, um, if you have a broad distribution, they behave differently. And you might well have a system where you say, well, I have bigger particles who do this and smaller particles who do this. So you have almost like a, a dual system by a broad distribution. I'm not sure if people thought about it uh, yet, 
the aim is always to have uh, a, a quite narrow distribution to really um, control what you're actually getting. But um, it's, it's actually an interesting thought. Yeah, I, I guess it's an, it's an interesting dichotomy, isn't it, when you're dealing with biological systems, because we do it all the time. We try and keep it as homogeneous as possible so as we understand it, but it might not necessarily give the best level of communication with a heterogeneous biological system. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I've got another question here. Uh, is the hypothesis that cell uptake reduces with increase in drug loading applicable uh, to the to the system of glycopolymers, or is it just is it just particular to glycopolymers? I think the question means. I think it's yeah. So um, what it is, people try to get away from this pack based system, and so they explore all sorts of um, polypeptides, polypeptides, glycopolymers. But I think all these water soluble polymers that they, they have a lot of hydrogen bonding as well, and it means um, you can get hydrogen bonding to the drug. And I think it's um, it's probably quite specific to polymers that uh, do show quite a bit of hydrogen bonding. So I don't think it's an issue with pack-based system. I would think in pack-based system is exactly what you expected. The more drug, it goes nicely in the core. It doesn't mean it's not affecting at all what happens in the shell. So because if you blow up the core, you will change the shape but you probably don't see that um, a problem that the drug wanders into the shell. And I think this is a very common with polymers that are not based on PAC. Right, okay. Are there any other questions? Either type them in or um, sing out, turn off your microphone and sing out. Mm. If there's not, I, I had one other one, uh, Martina. Um, yeah. uh, is an alternative strategy, or maybe it's been used already, is that would it be to take naturally occurring glycopolymers and, and modify them in such a way that, that they you get the properties that you want? Oh, yeah, definitely. That's um, people do that because um, <clears throat> there's some very interesting um, uh, glycopolymers, so for example, chitosan. It's very good if you want to um, um, target oral uptake, and so. Um, there's quite a bit of work um, uh, going on here, alginate. Um, so um, you're certainly right. If you uh, actually use actual um, uh, polysaccharides from nature, you have um, uh, less problems in some ways, but um, um, some of the problems you, you might have is that the polymer itself is not very well controlled. So we tried with chitosan and you get this really broad distribution and it can sometimes cause a little bit problem, so it might be a require a little bit more uh, fine tuning. But you're, you're right; there's some wonderful uh, natural polymers you can use as they are. Yeah. Okay, and I've just got one more question. I think we'll squeeze this one in from Alex. And it's: uh, What type of tissue models do you use for your drug screening? And have you tried organoids? And it's, uh, A very simple spheroid um, cancer um, based on a range of um, um, cancer cell lines. Um, but um, we worked also with a, a very specific um, model for um, ovarian because in ovarian cancer, it's not the solid tumor that's a problem, it's more the metastasis. And so we have a model here where you can basically look at your nanoparticles as a metastasis. But yeah, organoids are um, certainly um, sort of the next step up in sophistication. Great. Okay. Well, great. So like, on behalf of all of my colleagues who are online, Martina, thank you again for taking the time uh, to present to us. Congratulations again. And uh, I know there's uh, much more and continuing exciting work will come out of your labs in years to come. And uh, it's great to hear uh, what's happening in the field and, and to understand some of the challenges uh, as well and some of the strategies used to, to tackle those challenges. So on behalf of everyone online and indeed, indeed everyone across the Centre of Excellence, uh, a huge thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.